Okay. So I'm sure there's a lot of mixed emotions out there right now after the finale we just got. And now that it's out for everyone to see, I'm going to give you guys my full in-depth thoughts and theories throughout this recap about where I think the series is going. All right, so let's get into it. So the episode begins with Christy and Kenny heading over to check on Julie. Once they walk inside, they find Boyd staring hopelessly at the floor. As you guys already know, this man has been through a lot this season and the stuff just keeps coming downhill. And I'm trying to keep the cussing a little bit light because this is still early on in the video and YouTube's been acting weird. He walks outside to get some fresh air where he finds Jade chilling on the porch. Jade tells Boyd that Julie should be picking out a prom dress and not laying in there like... And although he doesn't finish the sentence, I'm sure he was probably gonna say something like laying in there like a vegetable. He goes on to tell Boyd that there's too much that they don't know and how it's like opening a book and starting from the middle or trying to solve a jigsaw puzzle without the edges. He tells him that the trick is to find two pieces that connect and then at least they'll have somewhere to start. And in this moment, Boyd gives Jade a look like it possibly triggered something. But of course, we're not sure just yet on the two pieces he might try to put together. And after Kenny walks out, he tells him that they need to go talk to Sarah. Then we cut to Donna, Dell, and Elgin as they arrive back on the road near the woods to look for Randall's body. But they discover that he's not dead. At this time, they also discover that there are no dead monsters out in the woods, meaning that Boyd's plan more than likely did not work. As they prepare to carry Randall to the van, he lets out this horrific scream. Then we cut to Julie over at Kenny's place who does the same thing. And over at Colony House, Marielle also lets out a wild scream as well. It's like they're all in sync. What the hell is going on here? Then we jump to Boyd, Kenny, and Sarah as they head back into the woods to the torture chamber. In this moment, Boyd gets Sarah up to speed on Elgin's dream and how the boy in white told him about the nursery rhyme. The same boy in white Sarah told him she saw at the end of season one before her and Boyd went into the tree. Boyd tells her the nursery rhyme and he also tells her how it's linked to Paula's death. But Sarah tells him that she doesn't know the rhyme, but she does know that the boy in white was trying to help them. She also tells Boyd how she doesn't think that the boy in white was really a little boy. And I'm really curious to know what she meant by this, but she doesn't further expand on the statement. I personally think that she meant that although the boy in white was visibly a kid, he was actually more of like a spiritual guide, or maybe he's something like an advanced AI, like the Red Queen from Resident Evil. And this place is some sort of cabin in the woods torture dome, or maybe everyone in town is unconscious, and he's some sort of ghostly simulated assistant who wants to help them escape. And I think I could literally crank out theories for this show all day. But anyway, Boyd goes on to tell Sarah that this is her chance to redeem herself because of all the evil shit she's done. And once they arrive, Boyd begins to explain the layout of the chamber to Sarah and Kenny. And in this moment, Sarah tells Boyd that she can now hear the music box playing. She tells Boyd that the music box is there, and then she starts digging in one of the corners of the chamber area. Then she stops and tells Boyd that she can hear them screaming and how it needs them to stay. Then suddenly she starts bleeding from her nose and begins to scream in pain. Boyd and Kenny try to carry her away from the area, but she breaks free and tells Boyd that it's laughing at him for bringing it back to the town and for setting it free because it wants to make everyone suffer. Then Sarah starts calling out to Julie as if she can hear her voice along with the others. She tells Boyd that they're dying and that once they die, it'll be too late unless he's able to stop the music. Please don't stop the music. But Boyd is confused because he doesn't know how to stop something that he can't see. And he asks Sarah, how is he supposed to do this? And she just tells him she doesn't know. And hopefully you guys like my little singing right there. All right, so I was very curious about what or who it is. This thing that seems to be amused by the fact that Boyd took it back to the town so it could torture everyone else. And I hope we get some sort of idea of what this evil supernatural entity is in season three. Or maybe that was just one of many other evil items they can encounter throughout this place. Maybe the ventriloquist dummy that Jade sees has some sort of evil attached to it as well. Because it definitely scared the hell out of Victor when he saw it. So Jade might be bringing something back with him in season three. And also while we're at it, I don't think them taking Grin and Gary's corpse inside for the autopsy is what caused all of this to happen. 
including the cicadas. Personally, I think all of that was caused by the fact that Boyd didn't leave the chamber like Martin told him to before the music stopped. And because he didn't, something latched onto him and he brought it back to town along with the parasites. And that is basically what caused all the problems that we saw throughout this season. But funny enough though, the parasites actually seemed to be the only thing that Boyd brought back with him that was actually helpful for him and the others. I mean, it allowed him to kill one of the monsters and it seems like things have slowed down or possibly completely stopped progressing with his Parkinson's. Because that hasn't really been mentioned like at all this season. So maybe the parasites cured his Parkinson's disease? What do you guys think? But anyway, we cut back to Colony House where we see Donna walking around checking on everyone. And it seems like everyone is preparing for the worse, which makes sense because if you're probably going to die the next time you go back to sleep, you might as well get right with God or whatever you believe in. She tells Matthias to lock the guns in the shed because she doesn't want them in the house. And plus, they've already made it through the night, so they don't really need them right now. Then over at Kenny's house, we see Tabitha telling Jim about Victor's mom and the children being trapped in the tower. And she wants to go there because she thinks that might be the only way to save Julie. Jim doesn't think it's a good idea, but Tabitha wants his support before she ventures off. And downstairs, she goes to ask Victor if he knows how to get to the tower. And he tells her to get to the tower, they have to visit the bottle tree. And of course, if you've already seen the episode, then you already know what the bottle tree is. Now, there were bottle trees in season one as well, but those trees actually weren't faraway trees. They were normal trees. But in season one, Boyd got one of the bottles down and it actually had the date 1864 on it. He also went on to tell Sarah that as far as he can tell, the other bottles in the tree had slips of paper in it just like the one he had, meaning that possibly there were other dates in the other bottles. That's my theory anyway, and I think that information is also going to be very pivotal in season three. Back in the woods, Boyd tells Kenny that they should all just head back to town, but Kenny doesn't agree that that's the right move because to him, it seems like they should be doing more since Sarah just told them that the music box is there. But Boyd is like, how do you expect us to find it? And he goes on to tell Kenny that there's nothing that they can actually do right now. He tells him that they know more now than they knew this morning and that the best thing that they can do right now is to go back to town and tell everyone that they're working on it and try to make them feel more calm and less afraid. And honestly, I was actually a bit surprised that the next course of action here wasn't to head back to town to get shovels or something, because the first thing Sarah does is she tells them that it's there, and then she starts trying to lightly dig with her hands. So wouldn't it make more sense to think that they might need to head back to town to grab shovels, especially since the music box might be underground? I'm just saying, and I could be in the wrong about this, of course, but their actions here really didn't make a lot of sense based off the information they just received from Sarah. They just kind of throw the possibility of it being underground out the window and Boyd tells Sarah that there is no music box there. I just thought that was a bit weird and easily dismissed, but there's a lot of that in this show. And once again, because I've mentioned this before in previous recaps, I just think the way Boyd figured this out was just way too convenient, and I felt like there should have been more of a struggle. But, you know, we'll talk about that more when we get to it. Over at Colony House, Ellis and Reggie apologize to each other and make up, and Reggie tells Ellis how he blames himself for Paula's death. But Ellis tells him that there's nothing he could have done and how it's no one's fault. And Reggie just looks at him like, yeah, right, you son of a... Yeah, sure, it's no one's fault. <laughs> and we already know who Reggie blames for this. After he leaves, Fatima rolls up like Jagged Edge and tells Ellis, let's get married. And we know he's been wanting to do this for a while, so of course he agrees. Then we cut to Jade over at the bar, who's just breaking a bunch of glass bottles. Then our old friend Tom pops up and he asks Jade what he's up to. But in good old Jade fashion, he checks with Tom before conversing just to make sure he died. And he's like, oh, okay, I just wanted to make sure we're on the same page here, that, that you are dead. He tells Tom that he's been trying to find different ways to look at the symbol because he feels like he's been looking at it wrong. Which is a good point, you know, maybe we've all been looking at it wrong. He tells Tom that there is an answer there, he's just not seeing it. But Tom tells him that he thinks he's overthinking it. And since Tabitha already told him where she saw the symbol, he already knows what he has to do. But just like any sane person, Jade ain't trying to go down there. But Tom guilt trips him by telling him he could save Julie. Which is really just Jade guilt tripping himself because Tom is basically his subconscious mind in this moment. Pretty much the same thing Father Cotri is to Boyd when he's stressed out or faced with difficult decisions. Jade's fear is fighting against the idea of going to search the monster tunnels, but he wants to save Julie, so we already know what that means. He's more than likely going to do it. 
Over at the sheriff's station, Sarah volunteers to go bury Paula since Boyd forgot, which he had a really good reason for forgetting. And on her way out, she tells Boyd that he's doing the best he can. Basically like, hey, chill out, you know, you're doing what you can. After Sarah leaves, Boyd just becomes more frustrated and the man is just trying to figure this shit out, just like the rest of us who are watching this mind freak of a show. Then we cut over to Matthias in the shed where he's locking up the guns like Donna told him to and Reggie comes creeping his crazy ass in there like he's up to no good and it's confirmed in this moment that he is definitely up to no good because he ends up slicing Matthias's neck and tells him that it's okay okay, he's just going a little sooner than the rest of them. Then Reggie steals one of the guns out of the locker and sneaks back out of the shed. And although we didn't know Matthias that well, it definitely seems like every time we've seen him, he has always been a loyal soldier for Donna. So that sucks ass and RIP Matthias. Ah. Then we cut back to Jade, who's now in the woods at the monster tunnels. And he does a really clever thing before he goes inside the tunnels and busses his ass. He uses a roll of yarn tied around a tree so he doesn't get lost in the tunnels. And honestly, besides Victor, in my personal opinion, Jade is possibly the most well-written character in the show. His logic and motivations seem to always make sense 100% of the time based off his character. And I hope the consistency of how this character is written remains the same throughout the third season. And I'm also going to be quite pissed off if he gets killed anytime soon. Soon meaning at any point before the finale of this series. That's if the show doesn't get cancelled before they're able to complete it, of course. Because I like Jade, he is easily one of my favorite characters. Soon after Jade gets in the tunnels, he sees that creepy ass ventriloquist dummy again. And of course at this time we still don't know what that means. I don't even really have any theories on what the ventriloquist dummy might mean. So that's definitely something that they're saving for season 3, for sure. Then we cut to the church where Boyd walks in and calls God an asshole for not helping them. He goes on an angry rant and demands that God gives him an answer. And during this time, Donna walks in and tries to lighten the mood. Over at Colony House, Kenny goes to check on Christy and Marielle. And Christy asked him, is this how it ends? She basically tells Kenny how she had hope when she first saw Marielle had arrived on the bus. But now she's lost it and feels like they're all going to die there. Kenny tells her that his father used to say that it's hard to see the sweater when you're just a thread. And he tells her that maybe they don't get to leave. Jesus Christ, Kenny. He says maybe they're just supposed to make it easier for people who come behind them to leave. And he's basically just saying that they matter, but not in the way that they think they do. Back at the church, Boyd informs Donna that Sarah said that Julie, Marielle, and Randall are dying. And that once they're gone, there's no more putting the genie back in the bottle. Meaning that once the three of them die, this thing will continue to kill off everyone else unless they destroy the music box. He also goes on to tell Donna that Sarah said the music box was right there in the clearing, which in that scene it didn't seem that way to me, especially since she was sort of lightly digging for it. But because of the writing here, I'll give them credit for making it more clear in this scene where he's speaking to Donna about it. Boyd expresses to Donna how he feels lost and he just doesn't know what to do, and how he feels bad for bringing this evilness back to the town. But she tells him that although he brought it back, he also gave everyone a lot more time than they would have had if it wasn't for him. And I'm pretty sure she's talking about the fact that Boyd found the talismans. Because without them, there would definitely be a lot more dead people right now. She invites Boyd to join her at Colony House to attend Ellis' wedding. And she tells him that although he wants to continue to focus on saving everyone, that the end of the world will be waiting on him when he gets back. Then we cut back to Jade in the tunnels where the little dirty bald-headed children just magically appear. They can be seen all lying around him on top of these large rocks, chanting that Ankui word. And the dirty children look creepy as ever in this scene. But then suddenly Jade looks up and in the roof of the cave we can see the symbol that seems to be created from the roots in the ground. It appears for a brief moment and then afterwards the children disappear and we can no longer see the symbol again. Then we cut to the woods with Tabitha and Victor as they search for the bottle tree. Initially Victor led them to an area where the tree no longer was. Tabitha just thinks that Victor got lost initially but I don't think that's the case at all. I don't think that Victor has revealed to anyone else besides Ethan that the trees are moving and personally, I think that's exactly what happened here. Victor also tells Tabitha that the trees that are currently there weren't the same trees that he remembers. Now, like I've said previously, since Victor forgot that he had a sister, it does make him a somewhat unreliable source of information to a degree. But that only really seems to apply when it's something that he hasn't drawn 
or a drawing that he doesn't have. If Victor still has possession of a drawing, then 9 times out of 10 his memory is usually very accurate. But anyway, they eventually hear the bottles dangling like wind chimes and they are able to locate the tree. Once they walk over, Victor explains to Tabitha how he found his mom's body on the ground in front of the tree and how she never made it inside. Victor tells Tabitha about the faraway trees and how his mom said that the bottle faraway tree was special because it leads to the tower. She prepares to step through but before she leaves, Victor gives her the most legendary item in the show. He gives her his lunchbox and he packs some snacks for her. If you notice, Victor's mind ain't too bad because he remembered to keep that thing on him and I'm sure he's got that gun tucked in his pants right now as we speak. But Tabitha finally walks through the tree and surprise, surprise, she finds the tower. And she looks up to the top and we can see that the lights are on. But just as it starts to get good, we cut away because of course we have to cut away. Over at Colony House, we jump to the lovebird's wedding and we see all those cryptic drawings in the room from Ellis, which definitely needs to be looked at closer, but that's a discussion for another video. The wedding starts and Boyd makes it on time to walk Fatima down the aisle. And I don't know why, but my girlfriend and I kept thinking that Reggie might snipe Fatima through the window for this crazy finale. And of course this doesn't happen, but it didn't stop us from thinking that it might. I don't know why we were just expecting some crazy shit to happen with her standing in the window. But anyway, so they begin to say their improvised vows to each other, and Ellis specifically says something about how many times he felt like he was stumbling in the dark while being stuck in the town, and how Fatima was the light that guided him through. And everything else that's said is just blah 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 lovey dovey trash. The important thing here that sets off a light bulb for Boyd is the part where Ellis talks about how Fatima was the light that guided him, and somehow this is all he needs to make a connection about what he needs to do to save everyone. We'll talk about this more later, but moments like these in the show are the things that kinda nag me the most. I love the show, don't get me wrong, but things like this nag me. But anyway, Boyd tells them that he loves them and he takes off. In the next scene over at Kenny's house, we see little Ethan asking Jim if they'll get to see Thomas again if they die. And Jim says yes, cause why not say yes? I mean shit, if a kid asked me if we would end up in the land of marshmallows after we die, I would just say yes, because you know, does it matter? <laughs> Let everyone have their own heaven. Then we jump back to Boyd, who we see retrieving the torch from the truck where him and the others spent the night earlier this season. As he leaves, there's crazy ass Reggie with a gun, ready to kill Boyd for bringing the curse back to the town. Boyd tries to tell him that he has an idea about how to fix things, but Reggie is too far gone and shoots Boyd in the shoulder. And then Boyd hits his ass with that quick draw McGraw and sends Reggie off into eternal darkness. Boyd stumbles his way back into the woods to the middle of the broken down chamber structure. Then he takes out a lighter and lights the torch and he is magically teleported back to when the chamber was fully built. And here is where he is able to once again hear and see the music box. He also finds Julie, Marielle, and Randall chained up here now, originally where we found Martin at the beginning of the season. Boyd goes to destroy the music box but Abby pops up again to stop him, which we already know that this isn't really Abby's spirit, it's just something that's using her image to try to persuade Boyd to not destroy the music box. But she tells Boyd that it doesn't matter if he saves them now and how it will only prolong their suffering because they will die later. They all begin to scream in pain as Abby tells Boyd that the forest doesn't feed on their fear, it feeds on their hope because hope is what makes them willing to suffer. But of course Abby's attempt at stopping Boyd doesn't work and he destroys the music box and saves Julie and the others. And then we cut back and forth between the three of them as they all slowly begin to wake up. Then after Boyd returns back from the chamber, one of our favorite little wild guide dogs show up. But we cut away before we get a chance to see where it leads Boyd this time. And before we move past this point, I have to bring up that thing that I mentioned earlier that nagged me about this. So I love the character Boyd, but I don't always like the writing surrounding this character and how he just tends to figure things out. When Boyd first found the talismans and he figured out how to use them, I thought that whole sequence was just way too simple and the character just figured it out so easily when there should have been a little more trial and error in my opinion. And now, personally, I feel like the same thing happened with the whole torch and Boyd knowing that he needed to go back to the chamber area to light the torch on fire 
to know that it would teleport him back to where the music box was. I mean, that one part during Ellis's wedding was definitely not enough for Boyd to put all of that together to know exactly what he needed to do. I honestly felt like a little more writing and detail should have been included there, and it would have made that whole sequence a lot more believable. But that's just how I felt about it. <laughs> you guys let me know if you agree or disagree down below, because I would like to know everyone's thoughts on this. Do you feel like there were enough clues provided to the character Boyd for him to clearly figure that out as quickly as he did, or nah? I mean, yeah, he struggles throughout the whole episode trying to find an answer, but I don't feel like the right clues were given for him to get the answer that he got, if that makes sense. But like I said, you guys let me know what you think down below. But back to the recap. So back at Kenny's house, Ethan opens the door and tells Jim and Julie that there's no more buzzing outside, meaning that the cicadas are now gone. Then before we cut away, Julie asks Jim, where's mom? Then we finally jump back to Tabitha as she walks up the steps to the top of the lighthouse, and we can see that it looks a lot like her dream. Also, here's a little cool detail that hinted at the fact that she would have to use the bottle tree to get to the lighthouse. We don't see it here now, but if we look back at Tabitha's dream, we can see a bottle sitting on the staircase, which is some early foreshadowing. We do see the toys on the staircase though, but not Ethan's finger puppets. We start to hear a kid saying Ankui as Tabitha gets closer to the top of the lighthouse. And once she reaches the top, she finally sees the boy in white who tells her he's sorry and that this is the only way before pushing her out of the window. The screen goes black for a second and then we can see Tabitha as she slowly wakes up in the hospital bed and it looks as though she has possibly found a way out. We can also see that she's covered in scratches and bruises like she was probably pushed out of a window, which is important because that might mean that that actually happened. She gets out of the bed slowly and we can see that the monitor behind her says St. Anthony's Hospital. A woman named Dr. Brody enters the room and tells Tabitha that three days ago, two hikers found her in the woods. She tells Tabitha that she was lying unconscious on the side of a trail. Then she goes on to ask Tabitha if she remembers what she was doing out there. And then the season ends with her staring out the window and it looks like she's now back in the real world. So yeah, there's definitely a lot to speculate on. But like I told you guys, episode 9 was a better episode, but there's some exciting stuff from episode 10 as well. And I think this cliffhanger was for sure a high note, much higher than the first season. So my theory is that Tabitha either time traveled or she teleported somewhere back to the real world. Now I did look back at a couple things and did a little research to see if this is where the Matthews were originally from or where they were going, but they're originally from Arizona and they were heading to Yellowstone National Park. And this definitely isn't either of those places. And this probably goes without saying because this is where the show was actually filmed, but this is definitely somewhere in Nova Scotia, Canada, and they're probably going to make it into some sort of fictional town instead of what it actually is in real life, which that's just my guess. And I haven't seen all of Lost, but I have seen enough to notice the similarities between From and that show. And at one point throughout Lost, one of the characters actually escaped the island and went back to try to save the others. And it looks like they might be doing a similar thing here with Tabitha now that she has found a way out. Of course, we can already assume that she's going to be heading back for her family and everyone else when she figures out how to get back. That's if my previous theory is correct, I mean. Because as far as we know, Jim, Julie, and Ethan might all be a figment of her imagination. And maybe she has a different family in the real world. But I highly doubt that this is true because we've already seen the missing posters from the real world. So I'm pretty sure that this is her real family. But that's going to be the tricky part, right? How is she going to get back? I mean, is she just going to drive randomly on the road or something and see if she gets teleported back to the town? And is her being back in the real world going to make national news since her and her family originally went missing? I mean, are people really going to believe her? Are they even going to be able to identify her? I mean, I just feel like things might not be as they seemed with the missing posters. They could have just pulled a fast one on us and maybe things might change drastically now that she's back in the real world. Also, did you guys see that symbol for St. Anthony's Hospital? It looks very similar to the symbol that Jade has been seeing, right? Or is it just me? Somebody needs to play around with the patterns of those symbols and see if you can match it up because I think there might be something there. But anyway, yeah, I definitely feel like this is an answer that we got this season someone actually made it out and we don't know much more than that at the moment but i feel like this is fairly exciting now we just gotta wait for the season three confirmation so we can get to the next level of this mind freakery for me overall i'm still enjoying myself and all of these damn questions that keep emerging but i'm sure there's going to be a lot of you who are satisfied with this 
And there's going to be a lot of you who are pissed off by this. And apparently you're going to stop watching, but be honest, you're going to be back. You want to know the answers just like the rest of us, so I'm sure you'll be back. Or back to these videos, one of the two. <laughs> but either way, let's talk about it down below. And as always, thank you guys for watching.